Hello, friends. Is it still snowing? No? Hooray. Anything stick on the ground? No? A little bit? Okay. No shoveling, though, right? Probably not. This is all good news. Yes. People say the American dream is home ownership. Nope. The American dream is sitting with a cup of hot coffee or chocolate and watching someone else scrape your walk or your driveway. Right? When you live in an apartment, that's one of the many, many benefits. So hopefully you're still enjoying those benefits. But we are back. We had a, a quiz to do today, right? Looks like uh, every, most people got through it, so we can go over this quickly. So uh, ignoring the test, the possibility of testing omnibus covariance matrices, which is arguably not as helpful because it's testing too many things at once. What are the first two steps? Configure all right. You have the same factor structure on the whole, and then metric invariance, otherwise known as weak invariance. Do you have the same loadings? So a more practical question: What does it mean if you don't have configural invariance? Practically speaking, what happens next? You're done. Yeah, game over. Do not pass go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. And why are you done? Uh, yeah, the factors are different. Everything afterwards is trying to see if the items relate to the factor in the same way across groups, time, or conditions. If the factors are not the same things conceptually, then it makes no point. There's no point to continuing. So assume you have at least configural invariance. If you have, say, the same items loading on the same factors, that's sort of the big picture, you have metric invariance. So we test equality of the factor loadings, and to do so, what do we free? Where does any discrepancy in the loadings then, where is it then forced to go? Factor something. I'll give you a, a hint. Factor variance, yes. The alternative group has its factor variances freed so that they can then absorb the differences in the loadings, whatever proportional differences there were. And what does it mean if you don't have metric invariance? What do you think? Yeah, it's the factor is not defined by the items the same way. You really can't look at whether your factor is related to other things equivalently across groups because the factor itself doesn't exactly mean the same thing. And I can't give you any anything more specific than that because it's really very it's very fuzzy. People look at the relative size of the standardized loadings for an indication as to ha what the factor is defined by, where items that have stronger loadings are more like the factor. And if that pattern of which items are more related differs across groups, then it follows that the definition of the factor differs across groups. And so it doesn't mean anything to see if that factor predicts something else differently across groups if the factor itself is not defined in the same way. Analogously, the next two steps, we have scalar invariance, which is tests of intercept differences. In other words, at the same level of the factor, so at a factor score of zero, we're saying that the expected item response does not depend on group. So two people with the same amount of the latent trait should give the same predicted response to each item, irrespective of which group they're from. So that's known as scalar invariance or strong invariance. And what does it mean if that falls apart? It's not good, I'll tell you that. It's not good for what? Yeah, factor mean comparisons then are suspect. Because what scalar invariance is testing is that differences in factor means are responsible for differences in item means. 
If that's not the case, then it's not meaningful to compare factor mean differences across groups because something else is causing item differences, not just the factor mean. In a longitudinal context, if we're testing longitudinal invariance over time, such as in example 7b, we want to say that it's the factor that's either growing or declining across time. And to the extent that the item means are changing across time in a pattern that's not consistent with the factor being responsible, then you don't know why the items are changing over time. It's not the factor, it's something else. It's some other construct that's causing it. So it becomes problematic to interpret factor mean differences as being indicative of the factor. Do you have questions? Or no, you're just waving? Okay, hi. Good to see you. I, you can just stop and wave at me, that's fine. I used to do a thing in the, at UNL where like, when people wouldn't listen at first, I started waving. I'd get two hands waving, and that usually helped. So I can go back to the two-hand wave if anybody wants to participate with that. I started singing next. That's usually pretty effective. But I'll try not to break into my cheerleader routine today, if I, but I save that for you know, rare circumstances in which everyone's comatose. So yeah, scalar, strong, factor mean comparisons. Next one then, residual variances. Doesn't have a special term other than strict means that the amount of not the factor variance differs across groups. If it doesn't hold, eh, I can live with that. So all of these steps fall under the heading of measurement invariance. It's what you want to have to at least some extent before you start doing things with your factors, looking at how their relations differ across groups, looking at how their means differ across groups or over time, over conditions, etc. Structural invariance is something that you may or may not be interested in testing. So structural invariance in one way of speaking is are the factor of variances different? Are the factor covariances different? And are the factor means different? And when people talk about testing structural invariance, just that phrasing tends to still say, no, I don't want them to be different. I want them to be the same. Like invariance is the goal. Another way of thinking about invariance, though, is that it represents meaningful differences. People may have hypotheses. Are certain groups of people higher in the latent trait on average than other groups of people? Is this latent trait more, is this relatant trait, that's a good one. Is this latent trait more related to something else in one group than the other? Those can be considered structural invariance tests, although people often don't talk about them that way. So one person's test of structural invariance is another person's research question. So long as you've got at least some degree of measurement invariance holding your things together, you can answer questions about the trait. So phrased differently, questions about individual differences and in change are structural invariance questions. Does the factor mean grow or decline over time? Do individual differences increase or decrease over time in the factor? That you can think of as, is there systematic change? Do those differences and change, or do those changes differ across people? That's structural invariance in another way of speaking. So this third step, you may or may not be interested in doing in this context. You may do it in another context, which is in testing the rest of the hypotheses that your factors are a part of. But broadly, but broadly concerned, it's structural differences are factor things, means, variances, and covariances. So those, I think, should have gone fairly well. Any questions or comments about those questions? OK. Then do you want to pick up back where we left off with example 7b? Why not, right? We're here. We brave the snow such as it is. So yes, back uh, give you a, a review of the story. These are real data. These are six subscales measuring uh, degrees of, let's call it, social functioning. There's three that are positively oriented and three that are negatively oriented that I flipped around so that higher is better for all of these things. And the idea is that there's three occasions of measurement, and at the end of all of this, the research hypotheses to be tested in this person's dissertation were all about change in this construct as a function of how long they've been in treatment 
and whether one type of treatment improved people more than the other. That was what this person wanted to know. All of this is the homework they had to do to get to be able to answer that question. Whenever you're interested in testing differences across time or groups in a trait, you have to worry about measurement and variance. Ironically, if you're interested in testing differences across time or groups in an observed variable, no one ever mentions this, right? I taught a whole year of longitudinal analysis, and I never once said anything about measurement and variance. You know why? Because you have a box, not a trait. So there's these extra things that you have to worry about if you want to work in the world of latent space rather than observed variables. And so that's why this person was beholden to do all of these extra analyses before they actually looked at change over time in this trait. So six subscales thought to form one trait. Given that we have three occasions of data, there's a lot of missing data, by the way, but up to three occasions, all of the traits go into the same model. So I have one trait per occasion. Those traits get covariances that we leave alone. We just leave them there. The idea that where you were at time one should be related to where you are at time two and time three. And the configural model that we started with is sort of eh in terms of fit. Now, I let this person go ahead because their entire dissertation and their dissertation proposal was worded about latent trait change and differences in change, right? And I wasn't about to tell them, you know, you don't have a trait, sorry. But just remember this as in the back of your head for a conversation we're going to revisit at the end of this example. Because there's another type of model that would probably have worked better for these type of data. When you're not sure that you even have a trait in the first place, trying to see if it changes over time may not work so well. So put that, in, put that aside for now. So do you want to review the code? Are you good with the code? for just setting up a factor model. We're back in the world of CFA, so we're back in terms of loadings, intercepts, and residual variances. The next example will be IFA, where we switch. So, good with this, or do you just want to go over? Good? Reasonably good? Okay, fair enough. So there's no labels yet anywhere. We're just listing everything out, and then we'll slowly start labeling them as we put constraints on there. So the first step, model 2A, and in my naming conventions here, I reserve the numbers for the steps of measurement and structural invariance. So one is configural, two is metric, three is scalar, and then I use letters for step within the step. So 2A means my first shot at metric invariance. Then we go to 2B and 2C and 2D and so on. So I just made that up. I'm just telling you so that you understand how I label things. But you can label them however, you, however you'd like. So to set metric invariance then, L1 to L6, I am saying that item 1 at time 1 loads on the time one factor the same way that item one at time two loads on the time two factor is the same way that item one at time three loads on the time three factor. So that L1 means all three of these stars are going to be estimated to become the same number, and the same is true for items two through six. So I'm saying whatever differences in the loadings that you did have across time are now going to be forced to go up to the factor level. The time one factor still has its variance fixed to one. The time two and time three factors have their variances estimated. They absorb whatever differences in loadings we had. What would happen if I went a little crazy and decided that time one needed its variance estimated two? Any guesses? M plus B okay or not okay? Start there. No one's made this mistake yet? Really? I do this like once a week. What happens?
happens if I forget the at one? Hmm? It's not identified. And so I will get a big error message that says, your model is not identified, standard errors could not be computed, blah, 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 blah. And if I scroll all the way down and I miss that message, I will still know that that happened because I will get a column of only estimates. No standard errors, no other output, no fit, no nothing. It's not identified if it doesn't have a scale. So at this point, all factors have to have a scale. In the configural invariance model, each factor has its own scale, a mean zero, a variance one. In the metric invariance model, they are sharing a scale. They are borrowing the scale from the time one factor. So time one is still my anchor point for this model. It has mean zero variance one, and everything else is relative to that on the variances side. So the variances are borrowing a scale because they are linked through the loadings here. The intercepts are not yet linked, and that's why all of the factor means still have to be at zero. So it's like they're sharing half their scale at this point, just the variance side. So we are saving a total of 12 loadings but then we had to estimate two factor variances. So that's a total difference in degrees of freedom of 10. So if I do my minus two log likelihood difference relative to the configural model, we found out that it fit eh, significantly two choices, better or worse. So we had all the loadings, and then we made them share. So this is worse, yes. When you take parameters away, it's better or not better. Or excuse me, worse or not worse. Ah! Hang on, I need to refuel. Let's try that again. When you take parameters away, you do it this time. I'm clearly incapable. Worse or not worse? Yes. So this is worse. So then we figure out, okay, which one broke our model? Or which ones, as it were. And this is where the voodoo helps you. It's still voodoo in the sense that it's completely data-driven and I have no a priori reason why any one of these loadings should be broke, break my model when it's constrained relative to the others. It's not voodoo in the sense that I feel allowed to look at it because these are constraints that I placed. So it's just telling me what I screwed up. So the first column under modification indices is the expected change in the chi-square for misfit if I were to implement the suggestion that it wants. And so I look at this, and the biggest one is 10, and that's for loading for item one at time one on the time one factor. Seems redundant, right? But it's not. Although item one time one is loading on the time one factor, it's not loading as much as it wants to because item one's loading is being shared to be equal across two and three. So what this is telling me is that item one wants to load on time one significantly more than what it's allowed to by the constraints. And if I went down the list, time one item five wants to load a little less, and time three for item six wants to load a little more as well. So I'm going to use its suggestion. I'm going to start with the most problematic constraint, the item one loading on time one. I free that by changing the label. 
So whereas it used to be L1 for all three of the loadings for item one, now the first one has an A after it. Doesn't matter what you call it, it just needs to be another name. I do A for alternative, you could have A, B, C, whatever. Up to eight characters at your disposal. That's the only change in the code. So now there's two model comparisons that I can do. I want to ask first, did I head in the right direction? I know the chi-square was supposed to improve by about 10, but let's check to make sure that it did. So in my spreadsheet here, I compared this 2B model that has one loading freed back against the full metric and variance model 2A. And the change in the chi-square was actually not 10, it was about 7. So these are projections, by the way, not exact. But it is significant, meaning I'm heading in the right direction. The model fit is significantly better after letting item one have its own loading on time one. The bigger question then is, is that good enough? So there's the 10. That's uh, the using the unscaled values, it looks like, to come up with those numbers. But still, relatively more should be good. So now, with one loading freed back, non-significant difference. So now I can say the model where almost all the loadings is constrained is non-significantly worse. So I'm good. So I can hold 17 of the 18 loadings the same. Pretty good. And if we look at the results, there's the pattern. The loading for item one on time one is 3.2, relative to 2.6 is the shared loading across times two and three. So for whatever reason that does not have to do with the trait, item one is relatively more important at the first occasion. Why that is? You'd be expected to make up a reason and put that as a something future research should look at section, right, to make that sound a little better. But for now, the correct answer is meh. And we get to move on. And I think this is about where we left off. Scalar. So a little trick with the M plus code. The I1, anything in a constraint label applies to everything on that line. M plus defines a line as something that occurs be, um, before a semicolon. So even though it's the same physical line of code, because I separated this out as its own statement with its own opening and closing bracket and its own semicolon, it treats this as a separate line. So it's a more efficient way to write code than taking up a whole separate line, but it means the same thing. Whereas the rest of them, two through six, I don't have a closing bracket and a semicolon, I just have spaces to keep the alignment so that I can read it easily. So all three intercepts for items two through six are constrained equal across time as a result. And why is it, do you remember, that we left this one off? Because what? The, the loading for it is non-invariant. Single elimination tournament. Once an item drops out, it's out. Practically speaking, it's because the only reason that the intercept may differ is because the loading differs. It just depends on where the intercept is located, what it's, where it's defined as a factor value of zero. You can still test it if you want to, but if it's not invariant, it could be the loading's fault. And so for that reason, convention holds that it drops out. So we're only going to test the intercepts that go with the invariant loadings from this point forward. And just as we freed the factor variances, 
when we constrain the loadings to be equal across time, when we constrain the intercepts to be equal across time, we free the factor means. Yes, ma'am. Let me clarify what I mean by kick it out. It's not kicked out of the model. So item one is still hanging out. It's still indicating the first the, the trade at the first occasion. It's being allowed to indicate it more at the first occasion. What's being kicked out is its chance to be invariant with respect to the rest of its measurement model parameters. So it's still going to have an intercept, it's still going to have a loading, it's still going to have a residual variance, it's still going to be in the model. It's just that, let me get the picture out. I, can't, I think I can show a picture that is better than words at explaining this. This one. This is slide 17 in lecture 7. So if you look at the, the bottom left picture here, this is what we would see in this case, instead of group one and group two, it would be time one and time two. The item is more related at time one, the slope is steeper, than it is at time two and three. And because those lines are non-parallel, the expected value at any one of these latent trait points is going to be different. And so it just depends on where zero is. So if I had set it up so that zero for my latent factor was like over here on the left, those intercepts, the expected value at that point might not be different. But if zero is in the middle, yeah, they're going to be different. So it's just because the, it's like, if the intercept is different, it could be because it was going to be different anyway, which would be like the bottom right picture here or it could be different simply because of the non-parallel lines. And so for that reason, it's not as meaningful to test it because we wouldn't know for sure why it's different. But it is still part of the model. It's not being kicked out in that sense. So functionally speaking, another way to wrap your head around it is that it's like we have a whole new item. Even though it's the same item from a content perspective at time one, two, and three, from a measurement perspective, it's like we swapped out the test and we just put in a new test at time one. And we let that new test have its own properties. And if you had done that, that's what would happen. You can have an unlinked test that's just sort of floating out there that belongs only on a certain occasion and has its own properties. Okay, does that help? Exactly, exactly. So if we had taken these six subscales and formed a total score, you can do that, right? Then we're, then we're screwed because we are assuming without testing that the way those six subscales relate to their total is the same across time. In addition to assuming unidimensionality, we'd be assuming tau equivalence. So tau equivalence is even stronger than what I'm talking about it would be tau equivalence and measurement equivalence because tau equivalence is that one to six is the same loading within a time. And in addition to that, not only is one to six the same, but each one to six is the same. So adding shit up into a total score would be like saying I got one loading instead of 18. For this, I'm at least saying, okay, I've got six, each item gets to load differently, but in order for me to say it's the factor that's changing over time and not the measurement of it, I have to be able to constrain these things to some degree. And yes, because we're dealing with the trait, it doesn't, we don't have to have the same items at each occasion. The more we have in common, the better, because there's a stronger basis for saying it's the same trait and linking them together, but it allows you the flexibility of either having missing data 
like somebody just didn't take the first test, or deliberately introducing missing data because maybe the test isn't relevant until time three. So if we look at some of the subscales, um, I think I mentioned this briefly in this real world example. Um, most of these, I think, are not self-report. These are being reported on by hospital staff. So these are baseline observations. Like, let's think about personal neatness. How do you describe someone who's neat? If you walk into someone's house and it's really clean, does that mean that they're a neat freak? Or does it mean they cleaned up their house because you were coming? Right? To differentiate those things, wouldn't you have to like show up unannounced like periodically and then see? So if I'm at baseline in the hospital and someone's checking off my thing, they're like, oh, this person's really neat. It's like, no, I didn't even unpack yet. I haven't had a chance to hoard my, ho my hospital room. Whereas six months down the line, you might have a better sense of whether or not someone has high personal neatness from seeing how they behave. So from that perspective, some of these things may not even be relevant initially. They wouldn't have to be administered. Or they're less or more relevant as time goes on and that would be reflected as having a differential loading. So a long answer to a short question, but it does count still. That's your short answer. It counts its own way. Okay. So other thoughts, questions on that point? All right. And let's see, where were we? Hey, we're here. So 3A, full scalar except for the one that got kicked out because we're not testing the intercept for item one at time one because it's already different because of its different loading. We compare this to our previous model, which was the partial metric invariance model. So we should have saved, let's see, uh, 11 intercepts, not 12 because we, we have one that's free, but we had to estimate two factor means and so that gives us a change of nine. Chi-score of 55 is not good, so we figure out what went awry. And here are the suggestions that are relevant. There's way more than this, but these are the ones that are relevant because they refer to constraints on the scalar invariance solution on the intercepts, so things in brackets. And the biggest one I've highlighted here is time one, item five. It wants to have a lower intercept than item five at the other occasions, it looks like. So I say, all right, sure, whatever. And note how I have done this item five at time one. Those two characters right there, that's the big difference. I closed off item five at time one as a separate statement, and therefore I5 only refers to the part that's after the semicolon, which is item five at times two and three. So parallel in structure to the first line here for intercept for item one. We repeat, are we headed in the right direction? Relative to the fully constrained scalar model, yes, this did help. Are we there yet? Partial metric versus partial scalar, nope. But that's much better. So we went from 55 to 27 as our uh, misfit. So we repeat. Now what does it want? Uh, item four at time one. Are you seeing a trend here? Time one is really not wanting to be part of this anymore. All of its items are slowly like, let me go! So I'm like, all right, we'll let item four off the hook. Are we heading in the right direction relative to the previous model? Yes, that did help relative to the partial metric model. Oh, so close. 0514. Some of you'd be like, it's fine, leave it alone. But no, I can't do that. 
because I want to see if there's any more voodoo that's responsible, because I'm testing seven things at once, and there's a chi-score of 14. And I've got item two at time one that wants to be free. Okay, fine. Repeat. Heading in the right direction? Yes. Are we there yet? Inarguably, yes. So we're at 3D in this process. And yes, I have seen people in their student projects get up to like 3X before. It, it can go on for a very long time. And yes, the more data-driven decisions you make, the more arbitrary it seems, I'm not going to lie. But this is more frequently the case than the perfect examples where everything is invariant. This is just much more what happens. So at this point, if we look at the factor here, only item three and item six are still contributing to holding invariance across time with this factor. The others all needed to be free. So here's my solution. It's important to consider the pattern of non-invariance and not just which ones need to be free. So in terms of the loadings, we know that item one wants to be more related to time one than it does at time two and time three, and the others are okay. But if we look at the intercepts, so somebody at this, with the same latent level of physical, what did I call this last time? I made up a word. Function, it's not functionality, but it's something like that. Well, beingness, I don't know. Do you remember? I made up a word, I know that. Would anyone like to name this factor for me? Anyone? No one wants to play? Uh, Let's call it not craziness. How's that? Something politically incorrect. No? Does that work? Fine. Well, if you're not going to play, then this is what I'm resorted to. Do I look like a clinician? Yeah, not so much. So, yes, somebody with the same latent level of whatever is nonetheless going to have a lower expected response on item one at time one than at the other two occasions. They are going to have a lower response to item two, as well as a higher response to item four, so less negative, and a higher response to item five. So for whatever reason, it's not just this factor that's causing their response. It's something else that appears to be unique to time one. And I think it's not unreasonable to think that it is familiarity with the patient if these are ratings given by a person who hasn't known this per the patients very long. You'd want to look into the content to figure out why it is items two, four, and five as opposed to three and six, but that I can't tell you. So then we do residual variance. Same pattern, we start off with the ones that failed already. So the only ones that are able to be tested across all three times are three and six. There's nothing that needs to be changed at the factor level to do this. So we give our first shot, the residuals, significantly worse. We go back, we look at the voodoo, so it's listing variances. So item five, wants to be different at time two or time three. It wants to have more not the factor variance at time two and less not the factor variance at time three. So I said, okay. So item five has separate residual variances at each occasion. Made the model better, heading in the right way, still significantly worse. Check the voodoo. Now item six wants a different residual variance at time one. 
even though that wasn't mentioned last time, I think. So we do that. And finally, we end up with something that's OK. So we're holding this structure together pretty well with the loadings, not great with the intercepts, and not so great with the residual variances either. Next up is structural. So here's my final solution. You can see in bold the things that need to be different. So there's two things that I'm testing here. I'm not testing the factor of covariances. I'm letting them go because they're not part of the invariance. They're just there because it's longitudinal data. The only things that are relevant is factor variances and factor means. So for the former, factor variances, I used to have my time two and time three factor variances estimated. I flipped those back to be one to make them the same. Compare model fit, not worse. OK. Do the same thing with the factor means. Actually, I did, I did do the factor covariances in this one. I didn't have to, but I was trying to be an, an overachiever, apparently. And there's the factor means. For the factor means, I ended up testing whether 2 was different than 3. So I constrained those two to be the same. It fit significantly worse, so we keep the original model instead. And this is our solution. So putting it together with respect to factor invariance, all three factors have the same variance. It was able to be constrained to one, not hurt the model. They have the same pattern of factor covariance across time, but they don't have the same pattern of factor means. The mean at time two is significantly greater than the mean at time one, and the mean at time three is significantly greater than the mean at time two. Otherwise, that constraint wouldn't have made the model fit worse. OK. So let me say that again in terms that you may think of from some other class for some of you. And maybe you don't, haven't had my other class, and so this is new. What do you call it when you have equal variances of something over time and equal covariances of something over time. It has a special name in the world of statistics. Do you remember? You will have learned this in a repeated measures ANOVA course or in any of my longitudinal stuff. Compound symmetry is the magic phrase. Equal variances across time and equal covariances across time. That is what the univariate approach to repeated measures ANOVA assumes. It is also known as what? What kind of random effects model? There's like four of you who know this. The rest of you can stare at me blankly. That's fine. Yep. A compound symmetry model, otherwise known as the univariate approach to repeated measures ANOVA, is a random what model? What kind of random effects model? I'll give you a, I'll give you a uh, three-part choice. Random intercept only, random slope only, only, or random intercept and slopes. Come on, I know you know this. Heather's like, I did know this. It's gone now, I'm sorry. It got replaced by theta. It's random intercept only. Yeah. So let me draw you a picture of what a random intercept only model looks like, folks. Pair a well lines. So let me go back to the front page. The point of this dissertation was to see if one group improved more than another group in order, let me state it differently, to see if group membership could predict individual differences in change. 
What did my structural invariance analysis just tell me about individual differences and in change? None. There are none. Rot row. And not surprisingly, do you think group predicted change? Nope. And I hadn't even seen the rest, the final chapter that was going to answer that question, but once I saw this, I'm like, nope, you're done, dude. You're done. Because if people don't change differently, you can't predict that non-change very well. And if a model that predicts parallel lines fits your data, then you don't have individual change. If, in this context, he had found that the factor variances changed over time, let me draw you a picture of what that would entail. Non-parallel lines. If people change differently, they spread themselves out. The variances have to change over time. So this is bad. This, this structural invariance holding is bad for what this person wanted to know. And he wrote it up. He turned it in, he graduated, he went on internship, he did a postdoc, and now he's living happily ever after somewhere. So it didn't really matter. But would you like to know what you can do instead if this happens to you? Would that be better? The whole problem could be avoided through one simple change of mindset here. He started the story with the idea that he had a factor measured by six things. What if you thought that you had six things that grew instead? Could you do that? Sure you could. So this type of model that he's fitting, this is a, an aside, but it's your bonus material you get for showing up live and in class here. I'm going to ask the Google to find this. This type of model lends itself to a curve of factors model. That's what this person was trying to do. Let me get go to Google Images here and find one. There's one. Is that it? No. That's a factor of curves. I want curve of factors model. There we go. There's one. Let's see where I'm stealing this from. Oh, Emilio. Hi, Emilio. He's an acquaintance of mine. Should have known. Here's his picture. Let me blow that up. Please? Can I please blow it up? It's not letting me. That's very sad. Oh, that's table one. No, nope. okay. No, this isn't going to help. It's this tiny little picture in here. Can you see that? This tiny little picture right here. But the idea is that you have three factors. I'll do it with my hands instead. Three factors. And then you're going to see if the factors grow over time. So that implies what's known as a higher order factor model. That's our next topic after we finish invariance, by which you have an intercept factor and a change factor and those then dictate the change of the factors. That's what he was trying to do. The alternative model that does not require invariance across time is what's known as a factor of curves model. And let's see if I can find a nice, a better picture of this. There, that's, that's a good one. Hey, I might actually get, hey, that's good enough to see. There we go. That's a factor of curves model. This is what he could have done instead. The idea is that you fit a growth model for each of your boxes as a first step. So that's what these little two factor models in here imply. You have an intercept factor and a change factor that describes growth in one outcome at a time. So he could have six of those. Then you see to what extent your intercepts and slopes are correlated across outcomes whether they all grow together or not. 
And if they do, then you can fit a latent factor on top as the higher order factor, a common intercept that then predicts each of the six separate intercepts and a common slope that captures commonality and change across the six things. So this is an alternative model that I think is more likely to fit in real data. It doesn't imply measurement invariance across time. And to the extent that people might improve more in one dimension than another, or a particular type of treatment is more effective in reducing some, this kind of symptom than that kind of symptom, those sorts of differences would show up in this model, but they would result in non-invariance in his approach, not his approach, but the other approach, that would not be as helpful. So this is where uh, the intersection of latent trait and growth modeling comes in handy to have in your arsenal. The idea of different higher order structures that would then be possible whether or not you have an invariance. But what it looks like is that there is not one factor that is causing change in these six items. Arguably, there's one factor that's causing change from maybe time two to time three, but time one is a different animal. And so the onus would be on the researcher to figure out what it is about time one that's different. Does it need different measures? Does it need a different procedure? Or should we just not link it together with time two and time three? I don't know. But that's what this analysis suggests, is that time one is just different in the way that these things relate to their traits. All right, and as always, words. So, questions? Yes. This is factor of curves, meaning growth curves. That's why. Even though this is a linear model, it's always curves no matter what. Question? Or you just want to look at it? Uh, so this would be, like, this is item one at time one, two, three, four. They're grouped that way instead. And so you fit an intercept and a slope factor that describes change in the box over time. You do that for all of your items separately. You can look at then the correlation across the intercepts and slopes. So at that point, it's just like a multivariate growth model. But as an extra step, if you want to, you can then see if that correlation pattern is consistent with a latent factor of intercept that's responsible for all the reasons why the intercepts are correlated, and another one that's like latent slope that's responsible for all the reasons why the slopes are correlated. So this model allows you to test whether people change in the same way across outcomes rather than just assume it. Other thoughts, questions? Okay. So guess how this works when you're in the world of IFA? Remarkably similarly, except for a few things. So picking up on slide 24, a few hiccups, but it's the same otherwise. Terminology is one hiccup. Uh, things you can do with one estimator versus another is the second hiccup. So measurement invariance, testing this set of procedures in the world of IRT or IFA is called differential item functioning. So non-invariance goes with differential item functioning. Measurement invariance is called non-differential item functioning. Non-differential, I couldn't make this stuff up if I tried, right? You mean like same item functioning? Yeah, non, non undifferentiating yes, diff, that's what it's called. So if you meet someone at a conference and you're like, what kind of research do you do? And they're like, I do diff. This is what they do. Oh, you mean measurement invariance. I can speak that language, yes. 
So yes, other than the change in the terminology, it's very similar. You have a multiple group model. If you have independent groups, you have to put your factors in the same model if you have dependent groups. Um, the only hiccup then is which parameters are getting constrained and what all parameters are in your measurement model. So there are two flavors of diff that are talked about in the IRT literature. There's uniform diff and there's non-uniform diff. And those are phrased in terms of IRT parameters, so A's and B's. Remember A's and B's? Vaguely. A is discrimination. It's the slope of the line at its B value. B is item difficulty. It's the amount of a trait that you need to have a 50-50 shot at the higher response. So either the one or whatever category threshold you're talking about. So if items have the same B, excuse me, hang on, let me get this back. If items have the same A but different Bs, same slope, different location, different difficulties, that is what's known as uniform diff. If they have different slopes, it's non-uniform diff. And so they would make pictures that look like this. This is uniform. So the slope is the same. The B value is different. One group requires more of the trait to have the 50-50 shot at the higher category. That's what that would mean. The item is harder for one group than the other for reasons that have nothing to do with the trait. Non-uniform diff would be a difference in the slope and possibly the location because of the slope. So non-uniform dip is different slopes. The item is systematically more related to the trait at that B value location for one group. So non, let me get this right, non-uniform diff would be analogous to metric non-invariance. Uniform diff would be analogous to scalar non-invariance, but with the same loading. There, that hurt. <laughs> I don't think I could say that again if I tried. But that's neither here nor there, because what we're going to do in M plus is not hold the A's and B's in out, uh, invariant, but we're going to hold the directly estimated parameters invariant, which is the loadings and thresholds. So in this case, the software you use matters for what you're actually going to be doing. If you are using IRT software, such as, uh, let's go, bylog, parse scale, multi-log, flex mert, uh, stuff in R that I don't even know what it is, like there's a million IRT packages, if the models are phrased in I and A's and B's directly, then when you do differential item functioning tests, they're going to be asking about the A's and B's. In M+, because the model itself is phrased as loadings and thresholds, which can be converted to A's and B's if you want to, the, the loadings and the thresholds are what are being constrained in the measurement invariance process. So we're, it's going to look a lot like metric and scalar invariance for CFA as a result. So we will test the loadings and test the thresholds. We would then have to figure out what the A's and B's would then be with the conversion formulas, and I've got some model constraint codes for that as well. So if I have a five-category item, Let's do a little review. And I fit a graded response model, such as an M+. How many loadings does that item have? Like in homework four, how many loadings did each item have? Uh, one or four? Those are your choices. If you have a five category item, does it have one loading or four? It's only one in this case. Not unless it's nominal does it have four. So that's one loading. So that's the metric part's going to work the same. How many thresholds does it have? 
one or four? That one's four. So if it has four thresholds, that means it would have four Bs. If it has one loading, it would have one A. So here's the formulas to go back and forth, just as a review. When M plus is going to output A's and B's for binary IRT models, it rescales them to have a theta mean zero and a variance of one. So it actually messes with the invariance of them. For that reason, I would encourage you not to use their version and to compute them yourself. That way, the A's and B's are as invariant as they can be without rescaling the model. There are two ways of telling M plus to do this for you, and it depends on whether or not you are using full information maximum likelihood or limited information weighted least squares. Uh, do you remember the difference between the two? There's several, right? So full information uses all the original data. Missing data assume missing at random, which is good, but there's no answer key. There's no H1. There's no saturated model because it's trying to reproduce all possible response patterns. So we don't get model fit. And if we don't get model fit, we don't get voodoo telling us how to fix broken models either. So you could have invariance testing and have no idea which item is the problem. Um, it doesn't do it directly. You have to trick it using class that's built for its uh, latent mixture model code. And I have its 70 as an example for that. We'll spend a little bit more time on the easier approach, which is WLSMB, which is the limited information. That's where it summarizes all of your items into a polycore correlation matrix, like the correlation among the probits. You can think of it that way. And then there's an H1. There's an answer key saturated model. So then you get voodoo. So then you can go through the same process that we did for CFA models, including testing residual variances. Residual variances do not exist when you're using full information maximum likelihood, so you can't test them. So there are um, the same steps that we will go through for IFA models as we did for CFA models, but I want you to be aware that there is some controversy here as to whether or not these steps are accurate. Um, this is actually a controversy within my own house. My husband and I disagree about this. So I'll give you both because I'm not sure who's right because I can come up with a reason for both of us. So step one is configural. Everyone agrees on that. Step two, according to me, Roger Millsap, and everyone in the IRT world, is metric. You test the loadings as a separate step. Then I would say step three is scalar. You test the thresholds. Now, other people will disagree that two and three should be done at the same time. So the mutanes, the people who wrote M+, plus, tell you to do it this way. My husband will tell you to do it this way. And so will other people. And their rationale is because in IRT the thresholds and loadings are linked together, because the loading is the slope at the B value, you can't tear them apart. You have to test them at the same time. That's their rationale. And my opposing rationale is if you have to test them at the same time, there is no such thing as non-uniform diff. If it's possible to have one be different and not the other, then that terminology that the IRT T people use is logically inconsistent. So I will tell you this. Some people tell you to do them separate, and some people will tell you to do them together. Cite whichever book you feel like citing as a rationale for doing this. So I will get, do both separate but you can all also combine these two steps if you feel like that argument is more compelling. So let's see what this will look like. We can get started on a quick example and finish it next time. 7C. These are the same data that we played with for the example 5 and 6A. This is a functional daily living scale, seven items. I'm now looking at invariance across men and women in the seven items that measure the single trait. I am using uh, weighted least squares to do so. So 
So in terms of differences in the code, when you're in an IFA model, so we're estimating ordinal responses as related to the, rate, the, the latent trait. We're using a probit link because we're in WLSMB. We're using a multinomial distribution, which is a categorical data distribution, so we're not assuming that things are interval, intervally related to theta or continuous, it's ordinal. We have four response options, so each item has three thresholds. And we tell M plus about this as the magical phrase up there, categorical. That's the one that makes it different, categorical. It reads that and figures out how many thresholds you need. Grouping, you tell it your multiple group setup. So here, men are going to be the reference group and, men, and women are the alternative group. One caveat with this procedure here. WLSMV assumes that each item has the same possible thresholds across groups. So you will get an error message if you try this if one group didn't answer all possible response options for a given item. You have two choices. You either recode in the group that has the responses to pretend like they're not there. So if you have two people who answered option five in one group and not in the other, you take those two people and make them a four instead, which should make you squishy, right? That's one option. Or the other is to switch to full information because that same requirement does not occur when you test invariance the other way. The trade-off is that then you have very little to go on in terms of diagnosing reasons for non-invariance. So we're starting with model here. This is going to be for the men. This code is going to stay the same. So everything is labeled in the men's model. In the women's model, nothing is labeled yet, and so this is a configural model. Each group has its own set of loadings, its own set of thresholds. The residual variances are fixed to one in both groups. This is a new thing that you haven't seen yet because at some point they're going to be identified and able to be estimated instead. And the overall factor is identified with a mean zero variance one in each group. So configural, good. Model fits excellently. Here are the differences in the factor loadings. Anything jump out at you? Women are red, men are blue. Do these loadings look proportionate? Not really, right? One and three in particular look like something's up. The rest of them? Eh, blue is a little bit higher. So that's foreshadowing as to what's going to happen here. So here's my configural model. Here's my metric model. L1 to L7, L1 to L7. So I'm adding the constraints to the loadings. In so doing, in the alternative group, I have to estimate the factor variance to absorb those differences in loadings. And how do I know if my model fits worse? Do I break out my spreadsheet? Where's my HO? It's gone. Crap, now what? There is no log likelihood because this ain't likelihood. Do you remember what we do instead for nested model comparisons in WLSMV? Hmm? Looking for a magic one word phrase? Starts with a D. I heard it. Say it louder. 
stiff test, yes, you have to let M plus do the comparisons for you. So that's another nice uh, feature of using these IFA models with WLSMV is that you don't have to enter things into spreadsheets, but you do have to add extra code to get it to do that. So that's what we will get to look at in more practice next time. All right, so questions before we adjourn for today. All righty then, um, office hours are after class. Let me know if you need help with homework five or otherwise, yes? Do what? It's for the homework. You want to talk to me now? Okay, but everybody else can go home? Okay. What she said. All right. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. <laughs>